الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد Indeed we begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal We praise Allah and we thank Allah We seek Allah's help and we seek Allah's assistance In all of our affairs In our dunya matters And in our religious matters Whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides to this religion of truth To this way of life To Islam None can misguide But Allah alone but whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to go astray, whomever Allah allows to become a victim of his hawa, of his desires, to become a victim of the whispers of the shayateen from amongst the men or the jinn, to become a victim of his own doubt and uncertainty, then there is no guidance for this individual. And there is nothing that you or I can do for them, even if they were from among our nearest relatives, our children, our sons and daughters, except that we turn to them, reminding them of the signs and miracles and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making sincere dua that He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guides them back to this religion of Al Islam with ikhlas and sincerity. My dear respected brothers and sisters, all you who believe, Fear Allah in the matters in which He should be feared. Fear Allah in your business. Fear Allah with your relatives. Fear Allah as it relates to those things that He has made obligatory upon you. The salah, the sawm, the zakat. And do not die except in full and complete submission in Islam. For were you to be raised up on the day of judgment, believing in a God other than Allah or with Allah, were you to be raised up on the day of judgment, believing in a book of revelation after the Qur'an? Were you to be from among those who are raised up on the day of judgment, believing in a prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then certainly you will be from among the losers on the day of judgment. And woe to the losers on that day, for they will never taste victory after it. My dear respected brothers and sisters, indeed the best of speech is the book of Allah and Qur'an. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most evil of affairs in our religion, the one thing that ties us all together, although we may speak different languages, eat different food, dress in different sets of clothing, are the innovation within the religion. It is the one thing that we can never accept because it is the one thing that ties us together. And no matter how good the innovation may sound, no matter how much sense the innovation may make in your mind, any innovation within the religion is a going astray. And anything that takes you astray will eventually lead you to the fire of Jahannam and to Allah's anger. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from His punishment and His anger. And My dear brothers and sisters, on this blessed day of Jumu'ah, in this blessed hour that we share with one another, I want to remind you, or to teach you, or to remind you of one of the virtues of the Qur'an. In that the Qur'an is not only a book of guidance, 
It is not only a book which helps us to see the difference between truth and falsehood, but it is also a book of healing, a book of cures, a book of medicine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, qad ja'atkum maw'idatum min rabbikum, wa shifa'un lima fi suhoor. Allah, he says, that certainly all mankind, speaking to the Muslim and the non-Muslim, certainly there has come to you a reminder, an advice from your Lord, and a healing for what is in the chest. And what is in the chest? The heart, the qalb. What is this Qur'an healing in the chest for the Muslim and the non-Muslim? Allah began the ayah with, Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind. This Qur'an has been sent down to heal what is in the chest, to heal the heart, meaning to remove the shirk and to bring tawheed and establish the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Qur'an has been sent down to remove the arrogance and pride and to clean the heart and to cure the heart and to place within it a firm belief and taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For certainly this heart, its function is not only to pump the blood throughout our bodies. That is how it keeps the physical body alive. But the heart is a vessel as well that holds and contains our iman and our taqwa. As the Prophet once said in front of his companions, huna wa ila sadrihi The Prophet وسلم, he said to his companions that taqwa is here. And he indicated and he pointed to his chest three times, meaning in the heart. But the Qur'an is also a healing and a cure for physical ailments. For when we are physically sick, when we are physically ill, when we have fever, when we have other forms of ailments. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions that fact in the Qur'an as well where He says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ and certainly we have sent down this Qur'an and what is in it from a shifa, a cure, wa rahma and a mercy for who? The nas? No. But this Qur'an is a cure and a mercy. It will heal your physical ailments for who? The mu'mineen, for those who believe. But if you were to do a quick Google search, a quick Yahoo search, and you were to type in cure from Qur'an, Cure from Qur'an, a ruqya You would find so many videos that are extremely bothersome and extremely stereotypical. You find imposters on the internet who claim to cure with the Qur'an and the one video you see time and time again is the woman dressed in all black with niqab, she must have the niqab on, shaking and screaming, and the imam is hitting her and shaking her, hitting her with the chair and reciting Quran on her, trying to run jinn out. Is this what the Prophet ﷺ left? Is this how the Prophet ﷺ taught us how we can use the Quran to heal, to shake people and to yell and to scream, claiming that we are removing jinn, claiming that we are healing? And what is more troublesome than that, even in a recent incident, we have people who take their children off of medication and they try to heal with just the Qur'an. And they often do more damage than good. And as a result, sometimes children, they die at the hands of their parents, the one who is responsible for them. The one whom Allah placed under their authority, they die because of their parents' ignorance, although their intentions were good. How many people have been harmed because of good intentions? My dear brothers and sisters, the question on this day of Jum'ah is how did the Prophet وسلم, teach the companions to use the Qur'an for a healing? The Prophet, he taught this Ummah of Ruqya. 
And what is a ruqya? The ruqya, my dear brothers and sisters, is a special dua. It is a special dua with three conditions. The first condition of the ruqya is that the one who is receiving the ruqya believes wholeheartedly that it is Allah who is going to cure them and not just the words and not the raqi, the one who is reciting the ruqya. The one who is making the ruqya, the one who recites the Qur'an upon an individual to heal them, he is called a raqi. The condition for the ruqya to be acceptable and to work is that you must believe that the one who is curing you is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not what he is saying, not the raqi himself, not the water he gives you to drink after he has blown in it, not the oil he gives you to rub on your ailments, but the one who is curing you is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second condition for the ruqya to be effective is that the words of the ruqya must be verses of the Qur'an or dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught or dua from yourselves, dua that you have said. Dua that is coming from you as long as it fulfills the third condition that it is free of khurafat hocus pocus, abracadabra it is free from these words that if you say them certain times if you repeat them a certain number it will heal you the words of the raqi, the one performing the ruqya it must be from the Qur'an or from the Sunnah or even yourselves as long as it is free from shirk as long as it is free from myths and khurafat. This is the ruqya. But that leads us to the second question. When using a ruqya, do we have to leave off modern medicine? Is a ruqya superior to modern medicine? Or is modern medicine superior to ruqya? For you find that there are people who will teach you, Muslims who will tell you, Leave off the medication and place your taqwa on Allah. Tawakkal on Allah. Rely on Allah. Use the Quran to heal you. Use the Quran. Recite the Quran. Wipe yourself with the Quran. Drink water from the Quran and leave off the medication. My father, Rahimahullah, when he came to this country in the 1970s, he had already accepted Islam back in Jamaica. But he met a man in Brooklyn, another Jamaican brother, who had accepted Islam as well. His name was Abdul Hakim, and he had a doctor's office on Church Avenue and Nostrum. And this brother, as I was told, because I've never met him in my life, he was a brother that was on the Sunnah before the people knew what the Sunnah was about in America. In the 1970s, he was wearing a thobe and wearing a turban in his private practice. He was a doctor and he dressed how he wanted to dress and he wore sandals every day and my mother says I never saw him in any color but white. And yet this man, the group that he was with, he died early in age. This man, Abdul Hakim, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon him. He was the one that told my father, you have a child, name him Hassan. That's how I got my name, Hassan. And my younger brother who was present today, when my father had another son, he said, name him Hussein. These are the two grandsons of the Prophet This same doctor was the one who performed the circumcision in his office for me and my brother. This is how close the family was with him. And yet, although he was a medical doctor, he died from meningitis. Why? Because he was told that it is better that he use a ruqya he was told that it is better that he places trust in Allah. He was told that it was better that he heal himself with the Quran than to take medication and he was a medical doctor. They killed him. So if it could happen to him, it can happen to any one of us. So when using a ruqya, is it more superior to modern medicine? Should we abandon medicine and just rely on the ruqya? What do we find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught his companions that the ruqya has a position in this religion 
and medicine has a position in this religion. For if Arukia was more superior to medicine, the companions would have taught us to leave off all forms of medication, yet medication existed during the lifetime of the Prophet It is the Prophet who said, إِنَّ فِي الْحَبَّةِ السَّوْدَاءِ شَفَاءٌ مِنْ كُلِّ دَائِمٍ that certainly in the Black Sea is a cure for every disease. If the Rukya was superior to medication, why was he teaching his companions to go to the Black Sea, to go to their medicine of their times? A group came to visit Medina and became extremely ill. And so the Prophet وسلم, sent them to his shepherd and he commanded them, Ishrabu min albaliha wa abawaliha. Tell them to drink from the camel's urine and the camel's milk. There was no CVS, there was no urgent care at that time. The CVS was the camel, and in that camel, in his milk and in his urine was a benefit and medicine. Why didn't the Prophet just make rukya upon them or command their companions to make rukya on them? He sent them to go get the medicine. He taught his companions of the benefits of the Black Sea. He taught his companions when they complained of stomach illness to drink the honey, that in the honey is a cure. So this idea that medicine is evil and that a person who takes medicine is not relying upon Allah is ignorance. And it kills, and it has killed, and it will continue to kill. My dear brothers and sisters, this leads to the third question. When do we use a rukia? And what do we use a rukia for? You find the majority of us, 99% of us, when we turn to rukia, trying to use the Quran to heal ourselves, our children, when they get fevers, we are using it wrong. Why? It is because we use and we turn to a rukia the same way that one turns to medication. What do I mean? When you have a headache, you go and get the Advil or the Tylenol. Do you take Advil and Tylenol when you have no pain? No! When you are sick and you have a virus, the doctor prescribes you antibiotics because you are ill. Do you take antibiotics when you are healthy? No! But you find that we use a Rukia in the same sense. That when we become ill, we turn to Arukya to heal us. When we are feeling pain, we turn to Arukya to heal us. When we feel that something is not right, we search and we ask the Imams and the directors of the Masajids, can you lead me to someone who can make the Rukya for my wife or my son or my daughter? But the Prophet وسلم, did not teach his companions to use Arukya like this. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions in a hadith, كَانَ إِذَا, كان إذا أَخَذَ مَضْجَعَهُ That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would take his bed, نَفَثَ فِي يَدَيْهِ He would blow into his hands, وَقَرَأَ بِالْمُعَوِّذَتَيْنِ And he would recite the Mu'awwidatayn, Surah Falaq and Surah Nas, وَمَسَحَ بِهِمَا And he would wipe with it, جَسَدَهُ His entire body. When did the Rasul do this? When did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do this? Every single night! The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was making Rukya every single night. He would recite into his hands and he would blow. He would recite Surah Ikhlas, Wal Falaq, Wal Nas in another riwayah, Surah Kafirun, Wal Falaq, Wal Nas and in this hadith, just Al Falaq and Nas. Every single night when he would take his bed, he would wipe himself with the rukya. He would perform the rukya upon himself. So when the time came that he was ill, he was already filled with the Qur'an. He was ready for the Qur'an to work on him. But you abandon the rukya throughout the year. Although it takes you five minutes, if that, when you come home from work and your children are asleep, what does it take you to recite al fala wa nas and wipe them as they sleep? It takes you no time at all. But you do not do it. But when they get the fever, let's find the Rocky. When they get the fever, recite Quran all night. You had the whole year to recite.
recite the Quran on your child. You had the whole year to recite the Quran on yourself. You had the whole year to recite the Quran on your wife. So now when you're in that moment and you need that Rukya to work, you find that it is not working and you disbelieve in it. And you do it for show, but without any yaqeen and any certainty. My dear brothers and sisters, indeed, it is very important that we educate ourselves on the mannerisms and the behaviors and the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for if we do not do so then we will continue to sit in a state of ignorance and as I mentioned ignorance can kill Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa Alhamdulillah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad Dear brothers and sisters please come close to one another there's a lot of brothers standing at the back we just want to make a little bit of space Please try to tighten the rows. There's only five minutes left. Barakallahu feekum. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we know, they were very eager to learn their religion and to learn what would benefit them and to learn what will enter them into our Jannah. And so on one occasion, they came to the Prophet and they said, advise us and tell us what will get us into the paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ began to advise them on the prayer and advise them on the importance of fasting and advise them on standing up in the last word of the night. And then he said to them that there are 70,000 who will enter into paradise without any hisab, without any accountability. And in another narration, each of those 70,000 will have 70,000. We're talking about millions of this ummah who will enter into the paradise without any accountability and the prophet went into his home the companions were left hanging they began to debate with one another who are these people that will enter paradise without any hisab, without any accountability i want to be from among them who are they some of the companions they said it is those who were born into Islam they will be of those because they never ever made shirk with Allah they never worshipped an idol others said no it was those who made hijrah for Allah's sake others said no it's only the shahada those who die on the battlefield and they began to raise their voices with one another as we know the Prophet's house is right next to the masjid so he came out of his house and he said what are you arguing about? O oh, Messenger of Allah we want to know who are these people why? Because we want to be from among them. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Humu al-ladheena la yaktawoon They are those who do not cauterize. What is cauterization? You know, back in the day when a person would get severely injured or maybe he would be hit with an arrow he takes the arrow out and what happens? He's bleeding profusely. How do you stop the blood? You take something hot and you burn the wound. You cauterize the wound to stop the bleeding. And that was not only in the past. Today, when we go for surgery, there are many ways that the doctors can sew you up. They can use thread, they can use staples, they can use glue, or they can use this hot needle that actually burns the skin to close it. Cauterization. The Prophet sallallahu said, these group of people that will enter paradise without any hisab, humul ladina la yaktawuna, they do not get cauterized. So the next time that you are going for a procedure, the next time that your wife is going under the knife, maybe for a C-section, you make sure that you say, you can patch up any way, tape, staples, glue, no cauterization, unless there is no other alternative. And they are those who do not seek out a ruqya. My brothers and sisters, question. If the ruqya was superior to modern medicine, if we were to use ruqya over medicine in all cases, why will Allah grant these people paradise if they never ever seek out the ruqya? Think! Why will Allah give you Jannah? No, he's uh, no, okay, he's not asking you no question, just enter. If you are from among those who do not seek out Rukia, you don't want the Rukia, you don't ask for it, you're not looking for no Rakhi. Think about it. And they are those who do not believe in myths and legend, Khurafat. 
they don't believe in it. A black cat walks in front of me, oh, bad luck, I have to cross the street. Why the black cat, not the white cat? I'm just saying. The mirror falls, it breaks, seven years, bad luck. What is this? I remember when I was young, we would walk to school, no one wants to step on the crack. We don't want to break our mother's back. Hurrah, that. Myths and legends. The rabbit's foot is lucky. How is it lucky? He lost a foot. I have it in my hand. How is the rabbit's foot lucky? They don't believe in these things. And upon Allah, they place their trust. Four characteristics. They do not cauterize. They do not seek a ruqya. They do not believe in myths and legends and omens. And upon Allah, they place their trust. My dear brothers and sisters, I mentioned that hadith to highlight one point. That there are people who do not seek out a ruqya. But just because they do not seek out the ruqya does not mean that they cannot receive a ruqya. And I don't want you to believe here, believing that a ruqya is something you should abandon completely. No. The Prophet, he said, وَلَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ They do not seek out someone to make the ruqya, but that does not mean that they cannot receive a ruqya. Meaning, that if your brother has some ailment, some pain in his back, in his side, in his knees, he's complaining. It is better for you to just place your hand on him without him asking for it. And say, إِنْ سَحِبَّاسَ رَبَّ النَّاسِ بِيَدِكَ الشِّفَاءُ لَا كَشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا أَنْ Perform the ruqya without him asking for it. That when a person is ill, as one of the companions came to the Prophet complaining of a stomach illness, the Prophet said, take your right hand and place it on your stomach and say, Bismillah, Just because he does not seek out the ruqya does not mean that you cannot perform ruqya upon yourself. And just because you do not seek out the ruqya does not mean that you cannot accept the ruqya when it is done without you asking for it. So I encourage all of you that the next time that you have an ailment or some pain, take your right hand and place it upon yourself. There are so many dua that is found. If you would just take a moment to memorize them and recite the ruqya upon yourself, I advise you that when your children are sleeping and you come home at night, that you take two minutes of your precious time and you recite the Qur'an in your hand and you wipe your children every night so when they have that fever, when they have that air infection, when they have that ailment and you turn back to that same Qur'an that you were reciting for months at a time you will find that the Qur'an will bring this cure and healing for them and last but not least, a ruqya is not to be used in every and any situation and Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anhu he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا ركية إلا من عين that there is no ركية except for the عين, the evil eye وَهُمَّةٌ and being stunned by some poisonous creature a snake, a scorpion, a mosquito, whatever لا ركية إلا من عين وَهُمَّةٌ ونملة and a نملة are the sores that appear on the sides of the body this hadith is authentic. These are the three situations and conditions in which the ruqya is applicable. But for everything else, that we use a ruqya for every other ailment, it only highlights again the ignorance that is prevalent within our community. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has safeguarded this Qur'an and has safeguarded the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whoever desires to open up their horizon and to seek knowledge and to learn about their religion, Allah will guide them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the evils of the shayateen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our wives and our children from the evil eye. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us and to increase our knowledge in the redeemed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and assist all the Muslims across the globe. Allahumma a'izzal Islam wa al-Muslimin. 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 Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Inna Allah wa malaikata يصدون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وكنصر